Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are tuning in. My name is Steve Schaefer, and I am pleased to uh, present today uh, a new application we've been working on, benchtop screening of wet clutch materials. And I have a couple of administrative uh, items I've been asked to share with you first. They're very simple. One is you are on mute, so uh, I cannot hear you. And hopefully we also can't hear your typing and such, because I know we're also busy. And secondly, that if you have questions at any time during the presentation, you can type them in to the questions uh, box or field on your uh, pull-down menu there. And I, uh, I believe I will see them. And I can either stop at that point if I do see them, or I can answer them at the end. It's more likely I'll answer them at the end, uh, because my screen is quite small on the questions, but I'll give it a go to keep my eye on my little box here. So with that, I will uh, begin the presentation. And uh, first thing I must do is acknowledge the uh, assistance of several people who helped me in this effort. Uh, I had some collaboration uh, data and images from the full-scale clutch testing. Uh, Tom Freshly at Luke USA helped me with that. I really appreciate that, Tom. And additional tests were done over in Germany. Dr. Udo Volz helped me and gave me some good suggestions on this application. And I also had some assistance in the lab here uh, in San Jose from Steve Papanicolaou. And I really appreciate that, Steve, as uh, we went along. So everybody helped me out, and uh, I want to acknowledge that. So where are we going? Here's the roadmap. I'll talk about motivation and background for the, the clutch test and material screening. Um, I will cover some past and current test methods, just, just briefly so you can see where we started and where we are, uh, how we developed the best benchtop test conditions. And if you know me, I always talk about uh, turning the tribo system into the tribo test by looking at the key variables. There are five elements I really worry about. Show you the sample rig, the sample and the rig configuration, and that's all the introductory part, getting to the point where it's towards the end. I will give examples of uh, testing we've done and uh, the solution we have been able to show for both clutch materials, different materials, uh, different automatic transmission fluid chemistries, we can see that effect, and uh, a run-in effect depending on the uh, aggressiveness of uh, the uh, clutch material against the counterface, and that was a very interesting phenomenon. So motivation and background, why do we want to do, why do we want to test clutch materials? Well, when we're talking about wet clutch performance, you, you could do this dry, but this is specifically for wet clutches, which are often paper-based. So smooth wet clutch performance is directly tied to the friction behavior. And there's a phenomenon known as HBN, harshness, vibration, and noise. It is strongly correlated with the velocity dependence of the coefficient of friction, and specifically, if we have an increasing coefficient of friction with decreasing velocity, so as the clutch is engaging, and people call that negative slope because we plot velocity from the left to the right, zero up to a maximum, uh, increasing COF with decreasing velocity promotes stick slip. And there's a couple of references down at the bottom here, and these slides will be available later. And these are just two of many, many references available, but uh, I thought I'd put them in there to give you a start, and you can find others from those, of course. Again, why touch cl test clutch material? Recently, uh, there's an increasing interest and demand for higher torque capabilities at reduced sizes for automatic transmissions. And the reason being lower weight, reduced sizes, means better fuel economy. And there's been a push for the last 30 years for better fuel economy. To get there, modeling of clutch behavior is an important development tool in reducing weight for these new clutch designs. And of course, in any model, you need data, and uh, coefficient of friction data are critical for these modeling efforts, because the modeling helps speed things up. There are many possible new material combinations and processing parameters exist to obtain the desired torque capability and also durability. Uh, we can change fibers, friction modifiers, abrasives, fillers, binders, the counter surface. All of these system components make up our tribal system and developing new materials and new uh, systems uh, gives us a lot of variables. Coefficient of friction data are typically obtained from tests from full-scale 
clutch test machines, and I will show you those uh, in the next couple slides. And these are time and resource consuming and also costly. So we'd like to be able to try and reduce that, still get accurate coefficient of friction data economically for the modeling efforts. Let's talk about uh, past and current test methods. And I'm going to use the phrase here, uh, historically early days, because I don't actually know when it started. But in the old days, design changes were both evolutionary and empirical. Uh, people would build and test clutches on vehicles. Uh, they wouldn't be too radical in their design change, because if it worked before, it'll work again. And really, the only thing uh, causing changes, uh, radical changes, might be a regulation, say we can't use asbestos anymore. But otherwise, they were pretty evolutionary. And in the lab, uh, more than 50 years ago, let's say, they did have uh, an instrument that tried to um, simulate clutches, and you'd build a clutch. It was a large-scale dynamometer. You'd test fully assembled clutches, and that at the time was called the SAE number one friction test machine. Actually, I think it wasn't called the number one friction test machine until they developed the number two friction test machine. Uh, but in those number one tests, the, frictions were, uh, the friction test was conducted under steady state conditions. They were looking at durability. They were looking at uh, coefficient of friction. About 50 years ago, a paper came out in an introduction. Uh, the SAE number two friction test was introduced. It's probably on the same machine, but it, the procedure was different. And in this case, they varied the conditions uh, to simulate in-service clutch conditions. And I'll, I'll show you a range of those uh, in the next couple of slides. In parallel, uh, lately, uh, in the last 30 or so years, uh, compared to the large-scale tests, people certainly have been doing um, small-scale tests. And here's a, here's a picture, as, as we go forward, of an SAE number two friction test machine. This is from Link Engineering, I think. And it's a pretty tall machine. It, it's about six foot tall. It's a big, uh, many-horsepower motor. And you detach, you can see on the front there, um, an entire clutch assembly to the front of the machine. And you can see some typical full-scale clutches over there on the right-hand side. So lately now, uh, there have been more individual effect studies. And these are combinations of pin-on-disc studies. Uh, there's a block-on-ring study. And they compare pin-on-disc to the SAE number two. People have looked at specific properties of individual elements of the oils and of the paper, porosity of the paper, fiber type, this sort of thing. And there's certainly been a lot of modeling studies looking at the dynamic effects, uh, judder, shudder, and chatter. And those are all things of interest to us. And again, uh, the coefficient of friction, its negative slope is uh, conducive to uh, judder, shudder, and chatter. And there are more references here from which you can find other references. I've just put them down as, a, as an introduction. There are many, many more. So why do we need a benchtop screening test after that introduction? Well, the answer is a little bit multifold, but it's quite simple. Friction data are used in modeling. Uh, many things affect the friction behavior, the materials, the porosity, the cure parameters, the counterface material, and roughness. Uh, so all of these things contribute to the tribal system. And it's easy and economical to make a small batch, let's say a single sheet of new clutch materials as opposed to uh, pulling something off the line and testing a full clutch. It is fast and easy to down select for a full scale SAE number two test and in service vehicle tests. And I'd like to make it clear here, we're not trying to replace the full scale at all. What we're trying to do is make those tests more efficient by doing some pre-screening so that when you do put a, a full clutch together with these new material combinations, um, for the SAE number two type test or others, uh, you have already down selected, and the cost and time and effort on those large scale tests um, is much more focused. So, what we're after is the small scale tests will rank materials and show us the same type of behavior we expect in the full scale. But I have to say, the dynamics of a small scale test are not the same. You don't build a full clutch, we're really focusing on the material aspect itself. Here's how we developed the benchtop conditions. We start, of course, if you know my slides, uh, turning the tribo system into a tribo test. My important parameters are the materials, the contact geometry, both macro and micro, the loading, the motion, and the environment. So I'm going to go through these five uh, important parameters and show you where we, where we ended up. 
materials in the macro contact geometry. Well, the benchtop test sample should be made of the same materials of interest. So these are prototype wet clutch papers or papers with different fibers or even uh, uh, lubricants or ATFs, what have you. So we're going to use what's, what's there. That's easy. We'll just use what we're going to try and test later on. The contact geometry is going to be a flat ring on a flat counterface scaled down. And you're going to see that on the right-hand side. And I know in some slides and many clutches, even wet clutches, have other macro uh, grooves in them, square shape, diamond shape, diagonal shape. Uh, we're not focusing on that. Those are for lubricant channeling. We're really going to focus on the material, which is why we want the flat ring on the flat counterface. And you can see there on the left-hand side is a, is a, is a real clutch, uh, which is about 150 millimeters in diameter, and our small-scale one is uh, more or less a bit over an inch in diameter. But it's a flat piece of clutch paper. Going down to the uh, micro level, and again, I'm, I'm excluding the macro geometry because uh, up above you can see the different channel patterns I was talking about. We're taking just a section of that and looking at the material's properties. And what I'm showing in this slide is that we have a minimum contact size. And that's because clutch materials, much like brake materials, are non-homogeneous in nature, both in the material and the geometric features. So I can, I'm showing here three different clutch paper materials. Uh, we've measured their uh, arithmetic mean roughness, R sub A, and you can see 3, 9, and, and 13 roughly. But you can also see when you look down that in, in the case of the 9, uh, upper right, the fibers are standing proud. There is some porosity. And in the case of the 12 or 13, which is a higher roughness uh, as measured by RA, uh, you don't see the fibers as well, but you do see more porosity, you see more holes. So those are going to behave differently uh, even though they have different roughnesses. And if we get too small, we're not sampling the, uh, the full non-homogeneous nature here. So we have to have a minimum size so we can sample enough that we get the effect we want. And these images are about one and a quarter millimeters uh, square. And what we've chosen is about a five millimeter uh, width of our uh, clutch material. So it is, it is four of these squares put together, actually 16 of them put together if you want to make a big square, and that we feel is enough material that we're sampling the non-homogeneous nature properly and not just focus down on one fiber or one pore. So we've established now our width, uh, kind of minimum width, minimum size, and uh, we can go on to the next parameter interest or parameters which are loading, motion, and environment. So loading, and what we've done is we've taken, since we thought we'd try and simulate exactly what's done in a particular uh, SAE friction machine number two test, is we've taken an OEM test, uh, original equipment manufacturer. This is something they would have run. We've just tried to replicate those conditions, roughly. So that test calls for three pressures of uh, 0.8, 2, and 3, roughly, megapascals. And on the bench top, with the size sample we saw in the previous slide, the 3 megapascals requires a 750 newton load. So we need to be able to do that for that size sample. The test also calls for 14 speed slip steps from 0. Point, sorry, 7 millimeters per second up to 1.7 meters per second. And again, for that size sample we've selected, uh, the equivalent linear velocity on the bench top sample for 1.7, the high end, is 1,200 RPM or 1,237 exactly. Um, so we need to be able to do that. And the same test calls for three different temperatures. So you've got your three pressures, your 14 speeds to be conducted at three temperatures, 40, 90, and 120 degrees C. Uh, and we can do up to that. We'd like to be able to do up to that. We can also do higher temperatures. And the limit really only depends on the lubricant. We can go to 400 C, but you're not going to see any ATF get to that. Typically, 160, 180 centigrade is as high as almost any lubricant in an automobile would, would go. And finally, the environment, we're looking at flooded lubrication condition, meaning we want to always be wet with lubricant. Uh, squeeze film and boundary depends on the speed and the pressure, but we want to always have lubricant present. And in the benchtop test, this requires only 15 to 18 milliliters of fluid, uh, which is quite small. 
the sequence, and again, to mimic these OEM specific tests, uh, they can do up and down velocity, which is a ramp test at constant pressure. I'll show you that. We're going to ramp up over 20 seconds. We're going to hold for 5 seconds and ramp down over 20 seconds. That's one of the tests. There's a breakaway friction, which can be done as a separate step, or you can look at the data in the, uh, the original plot of, uh, from 0 to maximum velocity. And then they reverse the loading direction. They go from high to load pressure. So 3, then 2, then 0.7 megapascal pressure. And when you add all these up, there's over 300 test conditions, and that whole test takes about a day to run on the SAE number 2 friction machine. So we're trying to reduce the time we can run these, but still get data that represents the, the same ranking and, and behavior as on the big scale test. Here are my loading and motion examples. And what I've got here are the, uh, for the speed slip test, you can see along the x-axis, uh, the blue is the, sp is the velocity profile, and basically you go from zero to the, the left-hand side, you're at your s seven millimeters per second, on, then off, then on, then off, then on, then off, and you always get up to speed all the way up to uh, the 1.7 meters per second on the right-hand side. And parallel with this, and I put them on separate plots, but they overlap the um, load profile shown in red, uh, the load is applied once we're up to speed, it's held for three seconds, and then released, and the speed is stopped, uh, and then we um, go to the next speed. And so these are, these are alternated so that you're always applying your load at the full speed. And in this particular test, you're capturing the coefficient of friction data um, at 2.9 seconds of the three seconds, and you take uh, eight data points on each side at your uh, 100 hertz data, data collection rate. Uh, you can also average over the full three seconds, and we've done that comparison, and that one's a little bit lower, but uh, as long as you pick a consistent method, you can choose anything you want. But since the OEM specified uh, 2.9 seconds, that's what we chose to do. Here's an example, and these I've plotted on the same graph, it's not so messy, of the ramp test. So you can see the red line is constant load, uh, and this is, this is for the example of the 3 megapascal test. And the blue line is the uh, velocity profile. So we're ramping up over 20 seconds, we're holding for 5 seconds, and we're ramping down over 20 seconds. And we collect data the entire time and analyze that for this type of test. Let's talk now about the sample and the rig configuration. So those are the types of tests we want to do. Here's a, a little sketch of the upper and lower clutch sample pair, and these would be provided. You, you would make one who owned uh, this and was interested would, would make these themselves. There's a backing plate and a uh, counterface lower sample. Um, in our test, we spin the lower sample, and we hold the clutch material stable, so we call that the upper sample. And there's the, ge the geometry, 29 millimeter nominal diameter, 5 millimeter width. So it goes from uh, 22 to 30, sorry, 20, <laughs> 27 to uh, 32 or something like that. Um, and the backing plate is, is pretty much a stamped steel or whatever you'd make those out of. Here's pictures of those samples. Uh, the upper sample holder is now behind the upper sample. It is screwed to it. The clutch material is pointed out on the left there, and the central hole is the supply port for uh, putting in the ATF, the automatic transmission fluid in this case, during the test. As you can imagine, when we're spinning at uh, 1400 or 1700 RPM, uh, the fluid is going to be thrown to the outside and not necessarily be recirculated uh, inside that interface. So we are able to pump it in through the central hole, so we're always under flooded conditions um, going across the, uh, the clutch paper. And on the right-hand side, we can just see the, the steel reaction plates. And these are just as received. We did take a little bit of Scotch-Brite to take that rust off, but didn't change the, uh, the roughness at all on those, uh, those samples. And here's the benchtop system. We saw in the uh, maybe slide three or four the, the six foot tall or the two meter tall uh, full scale machine. Well, the, uh, the UMT uh, Tribo Lab, TL stands for Tribo Lab, base unit is about three quarters of a meter tall. 
And on the left, you can see that. And on the right, you can see the configuration. I've taken the doors off so we can see it. You see the peristaltic pump we use to take fluid in and out. Um, what I'm showing there is a two-head pump. We're only using one head. The second head's used if you want to go through a filter in between, but we change out our fluid uh, between each test, so we did not filter it in this case. We just used a single head on that pump. And some more detail on that, uh, the right-hand picture is shown here. It's comprised of a, of a load cell. Uh, this one is 0 to 2 kilonewtons. Then a spring suspension, uh, because there's always some some run out, and we want to be able to damp that a bit. Uh, torque sensor there, 0 to 11 newton meters on that particular one. In the chamber down below, then we've got the insulating lid on top. We've got the heating chamber, which is mounted to the rotary stage. And that heating chamber, as I mentioned, can go to 400 degrees C. We certainly wouldn't use that. We limit it to 120 degrees C in our testing. And our rotary stage will go to 5,000 RPM, but again, we limited that to the uh, 1,300 RPM to give us the same speed as uh, the full-scale clutch in the OEM test. A little more details here. I've raised up the, uh, the upper sample now, and you can see uh, a self-aligning gimbal holder so that uh, any, any unevenness in the lower sample can be uh, accommodated. There is a thermocouple on the left that goes down into the fluid. There is the ATF supply, uh, the, the fluid supply uh, going into the upper sample holder, and you recall that drips out through the center. And then the fluid return is in that same uh, uh, reservoir that the fluid thermocouple sits in. So that's our details of our system. And there's a liquid bowl inside here that holds the lower sample. And again, 15 to 18 milliliters is all that's needed. It's really only 10 milliliters or 12 inside the bowl, but because we have the tubing, uh, we need some extra there to uh, maintain the, the proper level. And here's a video uh, I hope we'll play of um, showing it uh, spinning. This is at the full speed and when we stop it shows the fluid actually does flow in on its own which is why we raise up the upper carriage and allow it to flow back in but as a belt and suspenders approach we also pump it to the center. But this is showing stopping and the fluid reflow um, here. So we stop and the fluid flows back in Okay. In the next slide, I can show uh, the dripping coming in. So this is just showing the feed, again, of, uh, of the ATF fluid from the top. And you can see that pumping and dripping in. So that's being feed in, fed into the center as we rotate. Okay, so that's a description of the system. Uh, now I'd like to show some examples. The first example we're going to have is the 14 speed step test. This is probably the most common test and the, and the one people look at the, the hardest for the material behavior. And I've got four materials. This is in standard off-the-shelf uh, automatic transmission fluid and these are tests conducted at 120 degrees C. I've got, now we're going to show two slides here. I've got materials A, B, C, and D. It's too messy for one slide, so uh, too busy. I'm going to show materials A and B. And what we're showing on the left-hand side is the benchtop data, and on the right-hand side are the full-scale SAE test rig data. And these are plots of coefficient of friction versus sliding speed. And you can see the data points themselves are the 7 millimeters per second, the 14 steps all the way up to 1.7 meters per second, and the three colors uh, on each plot are the uh, 0 0.7 uh, gigapascals, uh, and that's, that's an error there on the, on the plot. It's, uh, oh no, that is, it's, it should read uh, one point, no, that's correct, uh, <laughs> megapascals, this is correct. 0 0.7 uh, megapascals, 2 megapascals, and three megapascals for the blue, red, and green respectively. The individual data points are shown and a line is drawn to show the trends. So we can see material A has um, positive slope in the low end and slightly negative or level uh, in the high speeds. Material B is positive slope 
all the way across from the low to the high, and that's a very good one, and that is the best material. And materials C and D, shown on this slide, C is, they're all positive slope in the low end up to about uh, 0.1 meters per second or 0.08 meters per second. But then material D shows a negative slope, and that's not good. And material C also shows negative and level or slightly increasing at the end. So B was the best out of all of these. You can see the positive slope the whole way. And what I want you to remember from these slides are that left-hand side, because when we get to the uh, effect of fluid, we'll see what a strong effect it has in the boundary regime in the low speed region. So here's C and D again. That was A and B, the previous slide. And now I'll show you the speed ramp test. This is just material C. It's the standard uh, ATF again. All these are tested in the standard ATF. And this is at 40 degrees C. And this is the result of the velocity ramp. Left, middle, and right are the different pressures. Uh, 0.7 MPA, 1.9 MPA, and 2.9 or, or 3 MPA. The top are the full scale tests, and the bottom three are the subscale tests. And we can see at the low pressure the, the dynamics. So there's some, some stick slip going on and squealing. You actually hear that in the lab. Uh, you hear it much louder on the uh, UMT benchtop because there's not a bunch of other uh, motors making a lot of noise. And uh, Tom tells me you also hear that on the full scale test uh, on the SAE number two machine, you can hear squealing. And so that, those vibrations we see are uh, how that shows up in the plot. And the middle and the right hand in particular, so, so here's, here's what we're talking about in these dynamic effects where you're actually hearing it in the lab and you're seeing it on the plot, both full scale and subscale. And then in the right hand plots, that's the low pressure where we hear it, where the vibrations are allowed to, uh, to emanate because the pressure is, is light enough, it's, it's not a stiff uh, contact in the material. Um, and we look at the right hand plots and we note that the breakaway is observed both in the full scale tests and, uh, and the benchtop tests. So this is a phenomenon you'd like to be able to observe. You can see it a little bit in the middle plots and you really see it in these right hand uh, higher pressure plots from the low velocity uh, starting at zero up to the high velocity. So we're able to replicate what's seen in the full scale tests also in the benchtop uh, subscale tests. Let's look now at the effect of uh, fluid chemistry. We have uh, both neat versus fully formulated. And actually, I'm seeing a question here. I'm going to try and bring that up and see if I can read it. Uh, is this temperature quoted oil or surface working temperature? That is the oil temperature. The thermocouple is dipped into the oil. We do not, in the present configuration, have a thermocouple in the clutch material, it is certainly possible in the brake work we're working on now, that brake application. Of course, we have a thermocouple embedded in the back of the brake material, but in this case, this is the oil temperature. Okay. Thank you. So let me go on here. This is the uh, speed slip, slip speed tests and the effect of the, of the chemistry. This is for a material a only at 120 degrees C, and what I've reproduced here in the top plots are the fully the um, uh, fully formulated ATF. So this is the off-the-shelf Ford fluid you could buy, and in the bottom one is the neat base oil from which that fluid is made, and you can see a clear difference in the low speed effect um, from the yes, from the uh, fully formulated one, in that we have a increase and then a decrease. Uh, in coefficient of friction, fully negative all the way uh, compared to the fully formulated. So it, that, that formulation is doing a lot in the low speed area there to help out quite a bit. A third effect we want to show is a run-in effect. And these tests were done with um, a different uh, set of uh, clutch materials, a much more aggressive fiber in this case. And what we see, well, I'm going to show you low medium and high contact pressures, so the, the uh, 0.7 GPA, the, the 1.3 and, and um, sorry, this should, be, this should be MPA, I think. And these are done at, at 20 degrees C at room temperature. And we can see five tests here at the low pressure 
the first test being that uh, dark blue at the top, and every successive test, what we were doing, the coefficient of friction is lowering because we, what we were doing, I believe, is running in the lower sample and knocking off the high asperities with the aggressive fibers. And it happens faster and faster um, as the pressures increase. So this is the low pressure, this is the medium pressure, and this is the high pressure. And you can see from that first one all the way down to the next, the next four, it only took one run at the high pressure to uh, get to the uh, uh, steady state coefficient of friction of the 0.14. And here's a plot, this next one is after run-in, low, medium, and high pressure in the uh, yellow, pink, and blue, the, the triangles there are showing. They all give you the same value now, more or less same behavior. The lowest pressure is always a little bit different um, because we've run in the sample, we've, we've turned the bottom sample and, and the top uh, interface more steady state and now we get values that are quite consistent across the pressures whereas we had different ones before. So this this is something you can see in the bench top that you may not see because it's not called for in the full scale test. So being aware that there's some run in taking place you can explore these phenomena um, on the bench top. So we're getting now after those examples to a, a wrap up and I'm seeing another question here that says, what exactly do I mean by a more aggressive fiber? Uh, you can imagine some fibers made of cotton, you can imagine some fibers made of uh, peak or, or what have you, maybe not peak, but maybe aramid, uh, nylon, you can make clutch materials from a different variety of fibers. So when I mean aggressive, I'm going to generically say a, a stronger fiber, something that is more prone to wear the steel or take bits of steel off and have it embedded and further wear the steel than, than let's say cotton, let's say aramid versus cotton or something like that. Okay. Here's some concluding remarks for this, uh, this new application, wet clutch material screening. First of all, we've, we've seen Agreement with full-scale tests were good in, in many areas, in the relative rankings, in those A through D, in the shape of the curve, in the magnitude of the coefficient of friction for each material, so people will also be looking at that, and certainly in the effect of chemistry. So we're agreeing with the full-scale tests, and uh, we're able to use this then as screening and down-selecting. We could also observe a number of phenomena. Uh, we could see dynamic effects, just like you do in full-scale. And that, that depends, again, on the suspension we use and the stiffness of the system, which is why you want to go to the full scale after these screening tests. But in our setup, we certainly were able to observe these uh, from the material standpoint. We could observe breakaway friction, just like you can in, in full scale tests. And we were able to observe the phenomenon of run-in. And I haven't seen any data from full scale because that is not something that is explored. You, you install the, uh, the clutch stack and you start testing. So run-in may or may not happen, perhaps on the down pressure, as you go up pressure, then down in pressure, you'd see differences between the first test and the last test, possibly due to run-in, but it wasn't something that's specifically explored in those full-scale tests. And, and the main reason is, is that the test cycle time is reduced and resources are minimized in the benchtop test. The changing of the clutch materials and the fluids is simplified. Uh, we saw in those early slides where I showed schematically the, the pressure and the speed, uh, the loading and the speed, those were 90 seconds. So each speed slip sequence only takes less than two minutes. So you can change out samples and, and run these, uh, these tests, including the ramp tests, in about 20 minutes. Uh, by the time you clean everything, it's more like an hour turnaround, but uh, you can test four to five sample sets in a day, maybe even more, uh, where you can only test one in the full-scale clutch tester. And uh, being environmentally conscious these days, uh, minimal disposal of fluid is required because only 15 to 18 milliliters is used for each test. So after the seminar, the webinar, you will receive uh, a survey and we really appreciate if you'd fill out those questions. And if you have uh, further questions I'm not able to answer here 
And uh, we'll open up the floor again uh, after the slide to additional questions. You can write to productinfo at bruker.com with uh, any questions or requests for information. And just so we can help keep track that uh, they resulted from this webinar, if you wouldn't mind putting uh, UMT clutch material screening in the subject line of an email to that address, that would be great. So with that, I'm going to conclude. It, it, we didn't take up the whole hour at all, but I said what I needed to say. And I'm going to open up the floor to, uh, to any further questions. And otherwise, uh, at some point, uh, Sarah will come back on and uh, end, uh, end the webinar. OK, there's a couple questions coming in. Do we use a new reaction plate and friction disk for each test? Uh, the answer to that is yes, that's what we chose to do, but you don't have to. Uh, we're trying to get um, good, good data from a fundamental standpoint so we know what happens with a fresh plate. Uh, it wasn't that hard for me to change, so I did it, but uh, the user has their choice. But uh, in these tests, we, we did that. I have a question on uh, which clutch materials can be used in the UMT. I I don't see any limit there. I think that's up to the users. We do not provide the clutch materials. We provide the drawing so that the user can make their own clutch materials or use a standard clutch material and change lubricants. So I don't see any limit. The answer to that question is to which clutch, clutch materials can be used. I have a question here that says, in the SAE number two, uh, clutch is, flooded, is the clutch flooded with lubricant? Uh, I believe some wet clutch applications, the clutch is only moist, not much lubricant there. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I was informed that it was flooded. There may be other test sequences for other clutches where it is simply moist. And in that case, you would choose to maybe just put a few drops of fluid in if you wanted to simulate those tests. But the ones I'm familiar with are fully flooded. Hi, Steve. It's Sarah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It looks like the questions are coming in a little slower. Uh, if, if there are any additional questions here, uh, please go ahead and type them in. Uh, this is our chance for a last bit of questions, and then we'll go ahead and, and end the broadcast. OK. I don't know if you can still hear me, Sarah. Um, I have a question I'm not sure I can answer. I'm not a sales guy. I'm a technical guy. It says, as a guideline, how much does the bench top test facility cost, I'm going to have to uh, refer that to, <laughs> to our sales guys. I, I think it's, it's roughly 140k uh, plus or minus in, in US dollars. Again, it's going to depend on, on the configuration if you buy other drives uh, because the, the system is modular. You, this is the rotary drive, but people sometimes also want to do block on ring tests or linear tests or reciprocating type tests. So that, that stacks up there. But I, I think it's in that range, one, 130 to 150. Again, contact your local guy, your sales guy. I, I shouldn't be held responsible for prices. But that's my feeling uh, based on what I've seen. Well, OK, if there aren't any additional questions, again, you can submit uh, requests for information or contact Steve through productinfo at bruker.com. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us today. And I uh, wish everybody else uh, a good rest of their day and evening. Thank you, Sarah.